On this episode, Christian dishes out some praise. This is software perfection. There is no program that is as perfect. Offers some harsh critique. This is a bad schmuck. This is not a good schmuck. This is not a good game. And considers career change into a pirate. I am controlling the ship. Mm. Hi everybody, welcome. This is LazyDevs Academy. We are doing a beautiful shmup in Pico 8. I am Christian and this is episode 3. Welcome to episode 3. Today we have two things on the agenda. Maybe three, let's see. One is I'm gonna do, we're gonna go back a little bit and, and make sure that the things that we did in the last episode are kind of like sitting. We solidify our understanding of the things in the previous episode. Uh, we are also, that's the second thing, we are going to look at the so-called if statement, which is going to be a very, very important statement that's kind of easy to understand and incredibly powerful. And the third thing I want to maybe work towards is us being able to control our spaceship with key presses. We're actually going to turn our animation into a game. Let's go! All right, I'm going to load a shmup. There we go. That is the state of uh, our game in a previous from the previous episode. Uh, hopefully, you did some experiments. You went to the doggy zone and you did some experiments, and maybe you came up with some questions. Or maybe you have some questions. If you have questions, post them down. But I will try to address some things that might have been unclear after the last episode because we did a lot of things. We went through these functions. We went to the init function, which is very easy to understand. Those functions gets called once at the beginning of the program. But then we have these draw functions and update functions, and they are called uh, 30 times per second, as I said, and they're kind of very uh, similar to each other. But one is for drawing things where we put things that are drawn to the screen. And the other one is for updating for uh, gameplay kind of stuff. And then we learned a little bit of variables and we plucked variables into green functions to, to draw crazy stuff on the screen. Or well, there's a ship moving away and there is a circle going down. Actually, things look a little bit like this. This is, this is what we had at the end of the, of the last episode. I did some experiments myself. Okay, so um, I wanted to clarify maybe one thing that might have been a bit confusing, which I, I actually surprised me as well. Why is the circle flashing, right? Why is the circle flashing? I understand why the, the text is flashing, because we put Harry, the variable Harry, we put it at the position where there you will specify the color of the text, right? If you put eight instead of Harry, you will see that color is red now. But why does the circle flash, right? Like if, why, if this is flashing, why does the circle also flash? Well, the reason for this is because here when we draw the circle, we specify the position of the circle, and we specify the size of the circle. It's Mimi, it's getting smaller. It's a variable Mimi. Uh, and then there is a slot here. You could put in a number for a color, but we didn't. We just left it blank. And if you do that, uh, apparently what happens to Pico 8 is Pico 8 is kind of like a paint program, like actually Microsoft Paint. This is software perfection. There is no program that is as perfect as this, <laughs> this software. So if I pick red and I draw something on the screen, like a, like a triangle, right? I'm finished drawing a, a triangle. Let's draw a circle now. And notice how the circle is also red. I didn't have to pick the color again, right? Like it's like you, you, you set, you pick a color and it like remembers that color, right? And everything you draw afterwards will get drawn in that color. Well, Pico 8 is kind of like this as well. Like if you pick a color, it kind of remembers that color, that drawing color, and whatever you draw afterwards, if it doesn't have specifically a different color, it will be just that color that was picked previously. And so this is what was happening here. We picked a color, Harry, and when we draw the circle, which is like a, like a flashing, like it flashes, right? And then when we draw the circle afterwards, we didn't specify the color. So the circle kind of has like the same color as the flashing text that is scrolling across the screen. That, explained that explains that problem. Now I want to specify something here also um, that might be confusing and um, which is kind of like this whole animation thing. Why are actually things moving on the screen, right? And why when we clear the screen, why does it like weird, like, why does it get all smudgy? Why are there so many circles there all of a sudden? Why, why we didn't, we just draw a circle. Like, why, where does that come from, right? Well, again, this is kind of like, 
this is here um, a situation where uh, Pico 8 differs from other development engines like, you know, like Unity or um, Construct. You know, in Construct, you would create a spaceship sprite and it would be there as an object on the screen and you could maybe move it around. But that's not quite how Pico 8 works. Pico 8, again, is kind of like a canvas, like our favorite program, like Paint. That's right. So Pico 8 is basically you have like a screen and you can put something on the screen and that's all you have. And so every frame you can draw something on the screen. It allows you to draw something on the screen and show it for a brief amount of time until you draw again something on the screen. And so let's just say we're going to draw a uh we're going to draw a spaceship, right? And let's Let's, let's say we're going to draw a spaceship that starts at this position and it goes, you know, it goes in this direction, right? Okay, so I'm going to draw a spaceship first. In the first frame, I'm going to draw it here. I'm going to have a function, my draw function, and it draws the spaceship here, right? Now, I'm going to show it for a brief period of time for a split second. And then I'm gonna draw my draw function again. And you know, the variables will move, Harry will change. And I'm gonna draw my spaceship again. But look, the old spaceship is still around. It's still there, right? It, it hasn't moved. It's, it's, I haven't cleared the screen, right? So you kind of have two spaceships now on the screen because you just, the canvas was not cleared. It was like the, the contents of the screen were preserved. So now you have two spaceships, and then if if you call the the draw function again after a split second, and you draw another spaceship, you can like the number of spaceships multiply. They you have like hundreds of spaceships, right? And so the question is like, okay, how do we avoid this? How do we avoid having hundreds of spaceships on the screen? Well, the way you do this is you clear the screen. So if you have one spaceship and you want to move it uh, to the to the side, you just have to delete the old spaceship. You have to clear the screen. Oh man, <laughs> I should have picked maybe a bigger eraser, right? You clear the screen and now you can draw the spaceship all over again, but now in a different position. <laughs> I, love, I love how the spaceships morph and change. <laughs> oh man. And so that's why, for example, the spaceship leaves like such a, such a trail behind. These are just like spaceships that we had previously on the screen. For example, if we add um, seven to Harry every frame, you can see multiple spaceships being drawn as I just demonstrated in paint. And that's why you have like so many circles because the circles just remain and we draw a smaller circle and we have like this weird rainbow effect. It looks beautiful and sometimes it's actually desirable, but most of the time we actually just want to have a CLS at the beginning of our draw statement, just so to specify this. There's another thing I wanted to emphasize and that is that the draw function and the update function are kind of very different from something like the init function. They behave differently because they are being spammed. <laughs> they are being executed over and over again and it's kind of crazy and I want to maybe show you how that looks because we didn't actually do a demo of it. So I'm going to comment out all of the other uh, statements that we had. I'm just going to go print and I'm just going to print Harry on the screen. Just print Harry, right? We're going to run this and you can see there's a number on our screen it goes up because we are you know just printing the contents of the variable harry which just gets bigger and bigger every frame it actually gets very fast uh, bigger because we're adding seven i'm just gonna add one so you can see okay now what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna again delete the cls and i'm gonna run it so as you can see, we are drawing, um, because we didn't specify where on the screen we're drawing the text, it will just draw the text next line, like in a text editor, right? So you can see how it just spams, <laughs> it just spams the screen with numbers because every frame, you know, we draw 30, um, 30 numbers on the screen. And so it just like, whoop, it goes down and, and, and completely fills, fills the screen and just keeps scrolling and scrolling because we're spamming the draw function because this function gets executed 30 times per second. Same with the update function, okay? Something to keep in mind. And there's actually a lot of mistakes that often happen because people forget that this is a function that gets executed a lot. And we're gonna get to it when we're gonna get to it. Right, and also maybe I wanted to actually get down to the bottom of some mystery that maybe you might be asking. So I said like draw and update are both being spammed 30 frames per second. 
but in which order are they being spammed? Like why they are like two separate functions, but is do we have first update and then draw or 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 first uh, draw and then update? Like what's what's the order of things here? Well, I don't know myself actually. <laughs> I've been programming Pico 8 since years now. I don't know myself. We're gonna have to figure this out. And actually I wanted to walk you through the process of me figuring this out. I mean, I probably could like Google this, uh, but also like you can just figure it out yourself. Like it's not that difficult. Okay, so I'm gonna um, comment all of this stuff for out for now. And I'm just gonna draw, uh, let's, let's, let's print draw to the screen and let's put it here in this location. And now I'm going to copy this and I'm going to put this in the update function and update function. We're also going to comment everything else. Uh, and oh, that I made a mistake. I made a mistake. I, I didn't put it in, in, in quotation. I, you have to put it in quotation because we want to draw some text, not a variable called draw, but text, the text to draw. Uh, and here in update function, we're going to um, print update on the screen. Okay. So in a draw function, we are drawing the text draw on the screen and an update function, we're drawing the text update on the screen. You can draw things on the screen in the update function. There's nothing stopping you from doing this. It's just like, um, it's not what the update function necessarily is made for, but there's like nobody, there's no police stopping you from doing this. There's no, you know, it's just like, it's just a way to organize our code. Okay, let's run this. And you can see it says draw on the screen all the time. You never see update. Ha. Huh. Weird. Why don't we see the update on the screen? Well, I mean, if we comment out everything in a draw function, you will see update if, because we're not clearing the screen and we're not replacing it with, with a draw function. Seeing draw on the screen all the time tells us something very important. First, every, for every frame, first the update function is called and afterwards the, the, the draw function is called. So actually the way we have our functions here is a bit out of order and I'm gonna fix it right away. But also this tells us something very important about the functions. The way, the order in which we define the functions is actually not important. We could have like the init function, as I said, the init function is the thing that gets called at the beginning of the program. We could have it at the end of the program. It's all the way at, at the end here. I'm gonna run it, it's the same thing, right? Because we're just defining the function. And when it gets called is something that pq8 decides for us. As I said, init function always gets called at the beginning and draw and update always gets called uh, um, 30 times per second in a specific order. Um, but of course it's confusing if the init function is at the end. So it makes sense and all we're always gonna do uh, we're always going to put the init function on, on, the, on top here. And it makes sense to first do the update function here and then the draw function. So we know in which order things are happening. At the beginning of the program, init, every frame, first update, then draw. All right, let's return to... Okay, something like this. Now, if you had any problems in the doggy zone, if you have been experimenting thing and you broke something, uh, don't, don't worry about it. Breaking things, making mistakes, making errors is something that happens all the time. It happens to me as well. It's kind of part of pro programming is. A lot of people have, um, have an error, have a mistake, uh, and some kind of bug in the program, and they feel like this is a sign that they're not made for programming, that this is somehow, <laughs> this is a kind of like exceptional situation. Oh no, I broke something. Oh no, I am I'm not a good programmer. My brain is the, I have the wrong brain for programming. <laughs> That's not the case. You, it's kind of like falling when you when you skateboard. Obviously, <laughs> falling is part of, of of skateboarding all the time. Even the pros, even Tony Hawk, is somebody who falls down all the time. That's kind of part the uh, you know part of the process of 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 um, doing this thing. So you will have a lot of mistakes, a lot of uh, bugs, and a lot of error messages, and that's fine. If you're confused by error messages that appear on your screen, do let me know and post them down in the comment section. I, I will try to address them. One thing that could be could have been happening, for example, is something like what, what if I just accidentally delete this this line if I just don't define uh, Harry at the beginning. I run this on, oh no, it's an error. Oh my gosh, I'm a bad programmer. Oh, I'm gonna <laughs> flip the table. 
Well, it says here, let's just read, let's just relax a little bit. It, let's see what, what, what Pgrid is trying to tell us. It actually gives us, gives us the, the location of the problem. It says like in line eight, there's a problem here. This is the line, Harry equals er, Harry plus nine. There's a problem here. Attempt to perform arithmetic on a global Harry, a nil value. And then there's some other text. Okay, so let's go to, and if confusingly, this is not where the problem is, but you know, that's how it works. This is line eight. You can see at the bottom left corner, there's line eight here, and here's Harry. And what did it say? Attempt to perform arithmetic on a global Harry. So arithmetic is basically, it's try to do math on Harry, on the variable Harry, but alas, Harry has a nil value. There's nothing inside Harry. And so it can't do any kind of math because there is no number, nothing inside Harry. Harry is an empty, empty thing. It doesn't, basically it says like, what Harry? <laughs> I never heard about Harry. I'm, you're, you're trying to make me math, but I don't know what you're talking about. And so, yeah, that's because we haven't defined a, a Harry. By the time it goes to update function, it did, never heard about Harry. And we're just gonna, the, the way to fix this is we're gonna have to define Harry before we do math with Harry. We have to put a number into Harry before we can do math with it. A very, very easy solution here. And this, by the way, this also happens, for example, if you maybe define Harry somewhere else that you didn't want to define. For example, if you move it over to the draw function and let's define Harry here, like we're defining Harry, right? Like we're putting something in Harry, I'm gonna run this and it still doesn't work. Why? Well, because we said that the draw function is happening after the update function. You have to put the number in it before you do the math. Just like some to show you kind of like the kind of like problems that might crop up. Now let us talk about if statements. Let us actually return what were we doing actually? What were we doing? This is a schmuck tutorial and I told to talk about Harry about I'm drawing some kind of circle on the screen. Like what is this? Let us get back. Let us get this train back on track. And let us actually start talking about the shmup. So let's do some critique of the shmup. This is a bad shmup. This is not a good shmup. This is not a good game. We have a spaceship and it flies away. That's not good. We want this. That, can we like that's that's it and now we have a black screen what is happening here we want maybe the spaceship to stop and maybe let's say we want to go back at least let's 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 not go into like controls and they just make it so it goes in one direction and then maybe it returns or something right can we, or at least let, let's make it stop <laughs> stop spaceship don't fly away <laughs> don't go away uh, well, we can do that. Let, I'm just going to delete the circles. I'm going to focus on a spaceship just, just on a spaceship here, right? And I'm going to actually delete our Mimi variable. We also don't need the Mimi variable. We're going to keep Harry around though. Uh, we also, see, that was a bug. That was a the error message. Again, trying to do math with Mimi. It doesn't understand what Mimi is. Well, we have to clean this up. I just want to simplify our program so we know exactly what's happening. We have a variable Harry. We're changing it in update function and we're drawing a ship on the position Harry. Now we're bringing in the, we, we have to kind of like react to things. We have to change the behavior of the program uh, over time. Right now the program always does the same thing. It just always moves the ship to the side. But we now, if you want the ship to, to stop at the edge of the screen, we want it to sometimes do something else. And for that, we're going to use the if statement. And the if statement is something that I never had problems explaining the if statement because people can't like, it's, it's, it's almost English language, right? The if statement is a little bit like a railway switch, right? You have a train and you have like tracks and train goes straight down the tracks. But then sometimes there is like this switch, like it's called a switch in English, I guess where there's like the, the track that, that splits, right? Like it goes, uh, one track goes straight, but then also this track splits off. And then there's like a lever on the side and depending on how the lever is set, the train will go straight or it will go to the side. And you know, there's some control rooms somewhere where people are to putting the switches and, and sending um, trains down different paths. Same thing with the if statement. If something, then end simple as that if something is happening 
then and then do whatever is inside the if statements. So in this regard, the if statement is kind of like similar to a function a little bit um, in the sense that it is also a block. There's something inside the if statement. Um, but And the thing that's inside the if statement is executed when there is some kind of condition that is fulfilled. If this, if the, what I wrote here in something, if that's true, if this is true, then do something. So I'm going to write something in here. If Harry is greater than 120, if Harry is greater than 120, then Harry equals 120. Now, actually, I'm going to move this because I realized we are doing this in draw function. We could do this in a draw function that doesn't make uh, like doesn't hurt us, but we are going to actually put it in update function because the update function is where you know gameplay happens and that's where it's where it belongs. To. Now let me um, explain to you. Let me like walk you through them into log logic here. So again, if statement, as I said, this um, statement must be true. If this is this statement is true, then uh, <laughs> the train is split to the side and we actually going to execute this whatever is between then and end right whatever is inside the if statement um, this symbol might be uh, confusing to some because i realized I, I made a game with those symbols and i use it all the time and <laughs> everybody playing this all the streamers were like i don't know what it means <laughs> apparently it's not as as uh, ubiquitous that's fine that's fine i'm gonna explain this so this is um sign, a mathematical sign that compares numbers. Um, there's a sister sign that goes in the other direction. Uh, and um, basically, um, the, the, uh, the, there's like, I think, two memetics. One is like, to me, it's like, it's always like, you know, it's like a wedge and, and it, uh, it points to, to the one that is smaller. Like, you know, things are getting smaller. Right, like you have like a big side, like something that is big and it's getting smaller, <laughs> and that's why the pointy end always points at the smaller thing. Um, the other memetic is like it's it's a, it's a Pac-Man, right? It's a Pac-Man, right? <laughs> it's moving and wants to eat things, and so the mouth, the open mouth, it's always facing the big thing. It's always always facing because it always wants to eat the big pizza, not the small pizza. So, so the mouth always facing, trying to automatically turns around to the to the big thing. That's the two memetics I have. So in this case, we say if Harry is bigger than 120, then something else happens. And so, and it's, it's bigger means like you know the the, the Pac-Man is turning towards Harry. If Harry is bigger than 120, right? And if we had it other way around, it would be if Harry is smaller than 120. <laughs> That's the memetic I'm going to use here. Okay, so if Harry is bigger than 120, if this statement is true, then we're going to set Harry to 120. We're going to reset Harry to 120. Let's run this. Bam! The flam! I told you this is hardcore. <laughs> okay, this is great. This is great. So now we can make a spaceship stop at some point. And you can mess around with this, right? You can be like, hey, let's put 80 there. Oh, <gasps> that's weird. Huh? That's weird. It jumped. I, I thought um, it would stop at 80, but it didn't stop at 80. Why it didn't stop at 80? Well, the condition was triggered at 80, but it didn't say like okay harry will be 80 it said harry is then 120 so <laughs> once it reached position 80 it jumped to 120. if you wanted to actually stay in at position 80 we would have to sit like this also very important why is harry not moving well because we are increasing harry here um, but after we animate Harry, after we increase the value of Harry, after that is where the if statement is happening and it is, you know, firmly resets it to 80. So it kind of like negates whatever math we did with Harry and we reset it to 80. So we can now make Harry stop at whatever position we want. That's okay, but that's not necessarily, you know, what we wanted. We wanted maybe to uh, the ship to go back and forth. Like, what if we can just 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 move back and forth? 
Um, and and you know sometimes I give my students like this 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 task like hey, can you make it go in the different directions and they 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 kind of like mm, okay well maybe if if Harry then if, if Harry's greater than twenty then we're gonna make Harry equals Harry minus one right that that would make sense we uh, we start decreasing Harry once once it it hits hundred twenty but that doesn't work that doesn't work. We have to step this through a little bit in order to understand why it doesn't work. We're moving Harry. Everything is happening well. Harry is under 120. We are still moving right, right? Everything is fine. The if statement is wrong. It doesn't get executed. The train goes straight. And then, you know, we call this function over and over and over again. Eventually, eventually, Harry arrives at 120. Or becomes bigger than 120. So eventually, this if statement is then true on one frame. On one frame, there is going to be a frame in the future where this statement is true. Then Harry is, let's say Harry is 121, right? Then we're going to say, okay, Harry is 121. We're going to subtract one from 121. We're going to reset Harry back to 120. And we're going to end the, the function. And then next frame, you know, Harry is set back up to 121 and and the cycle repeats nothing nothing changes it always like alternates between 121 and 120 and throughout this function and it just never progresses anywhere we have to remember the important rule that we had in a previous episode whenever we want to change something over time it needs to be a variable and I'm going to create a new variable for this. We're going to have a variable called speed. The speed of our ship. We're going to set it to one. At the beginning, I'm doing this in init function, right? We're going to take the speed and here in the update function, we're removing our ship. I'm actually going to comment in so we, we are absolutely clear what's happening. Moving the ship. We're going to say Harry equals Harry plus, not plus one, but plus ship. Uh, plus speed. Uh, now we have a variable that controls the speed of our ship. And here, if Harry reaches a certain position on the screen, what we're going to do is we're going to change the speed. Not the position of, of the ship, but the speed at which it's moving henceforth. So we're going to do something like speed equals minus one. The speed is negative. So it's moving in the other direction, on the opposite direction. We're going to run this safe run. Bam! It goes in the other direction. <laughs> we changed a different variable that controls the speed, not the variable that controls the position. Okay, million dollar question. How can we make it bounce back and forth? Now, I'm going to post, you should post the video and you should try to make, try and make it back and forth. Done. Okay. Let's do this. So we're going to do just another if statement. If Harry is smaller than zero, then speed equals one. Two if statements. Two if statements greater than 120, smaller than zero. The Pac-Man, the Pac-Man wants to eat the zero. Harry is so, if Harry gets so low that Pac-Man would rather eat the zero than Harry, <laughs> then it means that Harry is really, really low, really small. There's a really small number inside Harry. And then you, we're going to set the speed back to one. Bam. Perfect. Hey, here's a question from the future. Um, so I thought there would be, maybe later on, there would be some opportunity to explain another concept here, but apparently that opportunity never came up. So I have to splice it in after the fact. So uh, we were talking about these signs, these Pac-Man signs to uh, compare two numbers, uh, if a number is greater or, or smaller than a certain number. Uh, but you can also check if, uh, you know, a variable, for example, has a very specific value, uh, if it's equal 
uh, a certain number. Um, however, the, the, it's a bit unintuitive which character to use. Usually you would use equal like this, the, you know, the equal sign. But the thing is with the equal sign, it's already doing, actually we already said in a previous episode, it's actually assigning a value to a variable, right? It's not it's not used as we use it in, a, in, a, in math. Uh, the equal sign means assigning a, a value to a variable. So in order to avoid confusion here, uh, and the programming language that we're using here, uh, when it compares to numbers, then we're using the double equal sign, like we used uh, two equal signs after each other. So um, in an if statement, if you're comparing two numbers, you have to use the double equal sign. Um, if you use the one equal sign, it will throw an error. And uh, it's it happened to me a lot of times. It's still something that I struggle with and I wanted to spell it out right now here in the episode when we introduce the if statements so that maybe you uh, can avoid this problem in the future double equals sign i will mention it again later on if this comes up in this tutorial because this is a very important thing to remember double equals sign okay all right back to how it was before uh we're gonna we can actually make it go faster a little bit actually at the beginning it, it's a bit slow Okay, we have ship going left and right. That's good. Uh, we can actually make it even go even faster. Good, 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 good. Excellent, excellent. Okay, there's one thing I want to also mention about about if statement, and that's something that I talked about in a previous episode, and that's indentation, right? Remember how everything inside a function, for example, here has one space in front of it, right? Well, the if statement is kind of like, uh, you know, if we said that the function is kind of like a block. And that's why everything that's inside a block has to, has, has, has to have its indentation increased by one. Uh, the same thing with if statement. The if statement is also a block. It's not a function, but it's, it's a block. So everything inside the if statement has to be increased by one. The indentation has to be increased by one. That's why the speed uh, equals minus two here. That's why it has an additional space at the beginning, right? There's two spaces. There's one yellow, two yellow spaces in front of it. Same here. And it get, gets back to one space uh, when the when end statement is reached. Again, I'm doing this so we uh, know that this is inside the if statement and that this is also inside an if statement and that everything else is inside the function that the if statement was inside. As you can see, once you get like those nested things, it gets it's very easy to lose track of what the end is actually ending, right? You see how there's two ends right next to each other, or the, but that end actually ends in the if statement and that other end ends the function that we're inside. And it's very easy uh, to get those confused where everything is just flat, you know, it's like, okay, what? how many ends do we need at the end, right? It's like confusing what is actually belonging to what. So we need this visual uh, visual help here. I actually have some uh, some doggy zone stuff repaired, but before we do, I want to actually have us the the I want to actually show you how to control things with buttons. All right, so this is the Pico H cheat sheet that I've shown in the first episode. And oh man, it's so beautiful. It's, um, ah, there's so many, I forgot to mention that it actually shows you the colors here, that the Pico 8 colors are here. And there's actually here a little cheat sheet as well for um, the screen coordinates. That actually is something I, I should have maybe, should have maybe talked about previously, but now we can also talk about now. You can see how it's, it tells you the size of the screen. Width is 128, height is 128. It tells you, you know, that how the left uh, upper left corner is 0, 0, and how the bottom right corner is actually not 128, 128, but 127, 127, because it starts with 0, not with 1. There's a, there's a difference there. So that's great. There's, there's some good stuff in here. But what we are interested in here are ha, the controls. So here is some uh, hard facts about Pico 8. Uh, Pico 8 is kind of like pretends to be an old console, uh, kind of like the NES, the Nintendo Entertainment System, and that had like very, very simple game pads that had a directional uh, D-pad kind of thing. And two buttons, just two buttons, none of the new shenanigans in the new consoles that like analog sticks and shoulder buttons and, you know, everywhere there's a button where your finger is. None of that. It was just a D-pad and two buttons. A and B, in a case of the NES. In the case of Pico 8, it's circle and cross. <laughs> Not really a circle, it's a bit of a square here, but you know, you get the idea. 
So now, as you can see, here are some numbers, and that's actually what I wanted to get at. So each button that you have to each button that can be pressed in Pico 8 uh, corresponds to a number. And we can actually find out if a button is pressed or not. And it actually has those statements here. It's BTN or BTNP. And there's some stuff here. I'm going to explain that in, in a second. But for now, we're going to remember the, uh, the buttons. We're going to go left and right. So left is zero, right is one. That's something that we're going to remember, OK? Um, I'm going to keep this hairy stuff around, this the bit of that's, that's OK. I don't really mind that much. I'm going to say something like if btn open parentheses zero close parentheses then okay if btn one then this is weird, right? So previously we had like the statements that need to be true or false, like we're comparing the size of variables, but now we're just plugging a green function straight in here. Yeah, uh, we're gonna get to that a bit later, but also, but yeah, that's something that sometimes happens. Sometimes a function is not just something that does something like, you know, when we clear the screen, or uh, you know, draw a sprite on the screen. Sometimes functions actually return something. They are like, like kind of like variables. They kind of return a result. And in this case, the BTN function will be true if a certain button was pressed. Button number zero, left button, and button number one, which is the right button. So if button number zero is pressed, then speed equals minus two. And if button number one is pressed, then we're going to go speed equals two. Let's run this. I am controlling the ship. Now, it keeps moving. I don't like that. It keeps moving. It does bounce off the screen, so that's fun. But it's kind of like it's like on a slippery uh, ice kind of situation. It's kind of like weird, right? Uh, and the way we do this, the problem is like the speed gets set when you press a button. You know, when you press the button, uh, the left button, the speed gets set to minus two, and it kind of like stays that way. <laughs> it kind of like keeps going to the left. So we need to kind of like somehow reset the speed, and we can just write here in the update function. We're gonna write speed equals zero. So it's usually zero, but if uh, the left button is pressed, it gets set to minus two, and if the right button gets pressed, it gets set to two. Let's run this. Perfect. Now I can control the ship. Perfection. Uh, I wanted to see what happens actually when we hit this. Nothing happens. Okay, that's good. Now let's clean this up a little bit here. Um, so these things actually don't do anything anymore, right? These things don't do anything anymore. So that's kind of something that we have to fix. I would maybe even move the ship a little bit further down, some order of things. I'm going to move after we actually mess around with the speed to kind of like uh, make the thing a, a bit more responsive. Because previously, we st first did the math on, Harry, on the position of the ship. And then we change the speed, which will only have effect on the next frame by moving the math of, this, of the ship after, after we change the speed. It actually has effect right now on, on the same frame. I don't really feel the difference, but it's it's it should be more responsive now. Okay, uh, and maybe I want to fix the fact. I want to maybe fix the fact that we can now go off screen real quick. Uh, I'm gonna take these if statements. The, the uh, if it's greater than 120 and if it's smaller than zero, I'm gonna take it these. I'm gonna put them after the math. Like so. And so now we don't change the speed anymore. We're just gonna reset the position. Previously, we changed the speed because we want to have like the bounce effect, right? We want the ship to move on its own and return on its own. But now we're controlling the ship with a, with a, with a cursor, with a, with a 
buttons. So we don't need that anymore. We don't need to control the speed anymore. We just want to make sure that we cannot leave the screen. So we're just resetting the position of Harry of our ship. We should really change the, the variable name. I'm going to save this and bam! We are finally have full control of the ship. We can go left and right and we stop when we hit the when we hit the edge of the screen. Cool. Checking if we hit the edge. And this is gonna be controls. Good. That's that's it. That's it for today. We achieved our goal. We are moving things on the screen. We have learned about the if statement. If you have any questions, let me know. But now we're going to move on to the doggy zone. Okay. So actually, I today I have some really specific task for the doggy zone. Um. There's two things I uh, there's there's two things I want you to, to try. First thing I want you to try is we can move the ship left and right. Can you make it so that you can move the ship up and down? That's the first challenge. Can you make it so it's not just moving left and right, but up and down? Challenge number two, if you were inclined to maybe try this other challenge. you At the beginning, we had like the situation where the ship was bouncing left and right, right? Uh, on its own. Can you make it into like the DVD logo thing, you know, where it's kind of like bounces, like it goes diagonally and then bounces off different different um, edges. Like, can you make it uh, work like this? And the third challenge, which is a bit easier, uh, understandably, uh, if you know these first two are a bit a bit of a, a bit of a tough cookie for you. How about just it, it, see how it stops at the edge, edge of the screen? Can you make it so that it appears on the other side of the screen? When you fly out, you appear on the other side of the screen. And you fly here out, you come back on the other side of the screen. You know, like this loop around kind of effect. I want you to try this. Not that difficult to do. Maybe you have to mess around a little bit with, you know, positions and so forth. You got this. All right, guys, so this is going to be the end of this episode. This is the part where I will do a huge shout out to the coffee crew. That's right, this video series has been made possible through the generous support of my supporters on Coffee. Thank you so much for your support. And if you aren't a supporter yet, consider a sub or a one-time donation over at Coffee. One of the major perks is that you'll gain access to new episodes of this series earlier, so there's no need to wait. And there's also all sorts of other behind-the-scenes features. Check it out at coffee.com slash lazydevs. All right, so this is gonna be this episode. This is now the if statement and we can now finally control our ship with, with presses, with button presses. So this is good. We are on our way to make an awesome schmuck. Next episode, we are going to do more things with button presses. We're gonna to try to fire a bullet. Uh, maybe we're just gonna be sound. Maybe even animations. Let's see about that. See you next episode, guys. Bye-bye.